Hi, in this section we are going to discuss line cable modeling. So one of the main challenges that we have is that line, line and cable models must be valid for a pretty wide range of frequency, uh, starting from uh, lightning and uh, uh, even uh, very fast trend, uh, very fast transients. So we are talking about megahertz or hundreds of thousands of uh, of hertz, um, and we also have to cover lightning, uh, 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 switching, sorry, trend and stability, and also a shorter term, uh, you know, like load flow, for example, which can uh, load flow and, and slow stability. So it's pretty tough to have a line model which covers all range. Um, when you are talking about close to a fundamental frequency phenomena, it's mostly the positive and zero sequence that play a role, whereas when you go in a higher frequency, higher frequencies, you have um, phenomena like the skin effect, for example, which is modify, uh, increase the resistance. And similarly, inductances and capacitance will also vary when the frequency gets uh, higher. Within the EMTP library, we have those uh, devices. Uh, so we see here the, the Pi model. Uh, we, uh, we will go through each of them right after to explain what they do. Uh, we have here the constant parameter model, the double circuit constant parameter. Here the cable data calculation routine. Uh, this, this device here is a corona model. It allows to reproduce the corona effect uh, for lighting, for example. Uh, we won't cover it in this uh, section. Here you have the line data cable, uh, the line data um, calculation, uh, the frequency dependent model, uh, another representation of the Pi model. So it's really up to the user to use whatever they want. And here a tower. This tower is actually not is not actually in the um, in the library, but it's in an example. Uh, you have the, the possibility to model the tower in detail. This is also used for lightning study. Um, and so then you will model precisely the insulation chain in order to then connect the lightning strike and see backflash overs and such things. We have a device, a database device, which provide uh, existing design for towers. And so basically it will uh, fill automatically the line data calculation. There is also a, another, another frequency-dependent model which is called, called wideband and which is actually the one we recommend to use uh, for uh, lightning and switching studies. So let's go through each of them individually. Here you have the Pi line uh, cable, so the same uh, device is used for both line and cable. Um, it's the most simple, obviously. Uh, here, basically, all the capacitance of the line or the cable are lumped and put on uh, each side of the device. Then all the resistive effect is also lumped in the resistance and something for the inductance. Uh, obviously, here, traveling waves are not uh, considered. Um, here, it's a RLC circuit, so it will have one natural frequency. You can guess that for switching it, it will not be a great model. For example, if you here switch uh, is a load to this, um, if you switch a load to this line, you basically connect the load directly to this ideal capacitor bank, which, which uh, represents half of the capacitive effect of the line. And so this capacitor bank will discharge uh, very quickly into the load. Uh, more quicker actually than what it's supposed to be because in reality it will discharge you know step by step. Um, the advantage of this model is that it's uh, it doesn't require so much data so you only need positive sequence and zero sequence data um, to build that so you, those are available in most programs. Um, the, it's um, obviously when we go to a higher frequency simulations like lightning and switching, we won't use this model except when the cable and the line is very short. In this case, when the cable and the line is very short, the, the first natural frequency will be very far on the frequency axis in maybe the 
the megahertz region. And so then there will be no impact of using such a model. Um, it will be a case by case, of course, a, a short line for a switching study. It will be, you know, a mile or a few kilometers for lightning. It's uh, 10 meters. And so the length is relative, of course, to the, the frequency you're studying. Um, it's a, a great model for uh, steady state and uh, load flow simulation um, and stability simulation as well when the frequency doesn't change so much. Then we have the constant parameter model. Um, so this model, it's kind of like an equivalent of if you take a line, you cut it in an infinity of small section and you reproduce those small sections in a with pi. So it's like a mathematically an integral of an infinite of a very small pi. Um, the new thing with this model compared to pi is that this one reproduces uh, traveling wave propagation. When you switch, what does that mean? When you will energize, for example, the line on one hand, a traveling wave will be generated, traveling the speed of, almost the speed of light for a line and about a third of the speed of light for a cable. It will reflect here at the end and come back and forth like this, and it may propagate to other transmission lines. Um, it's not so accurate, though, for a large frequency band because the parameters are constant. So when you build this model, either you provide positive and zero sequence data plus the length. Um, in this case, you have a model valid for 60 hertz or 50 hertz fundamental frequency. You may also use a parameter calculator and calculate parameters for a higher frequency, for example, the lightning frequency region. Uh, and, and so in this case, the model is valid for lightning only. Um, this device comes into a several version. You have the three phase version here. Uh, you have the end phase version, which will automatically adapt. And you have a double circuit. The goal of the double circuit is to consider two balanced circuits. So two balanced three phase circuits, which are coupled. So like when you have uh, two circuits on the same tower, for example. Because we simulate traveling waves here, um, this introduce, uh, introduces a uh, constraint for time step. You need to select a time step which is small enough to let you simulate the back and forth of those traveling waves. Um, if you consider that the traveling wave for a line is traveling almost the speed of light, you can easily evaluate the time it will take for the traveling wave to go from one hand to another. Then it's considered, we call that, by the way, the, the traveling time. It's, con it's uh, recommended to use a time step at least 10 times smaller than this traveling time in order to get good precision. And so that's a reason why uh, when it's not possible to respect this time constraint, uh, this time step constraint, you will use a pi model instead of a CP or other uh, uh, distributed parameter line. Uh, those lines are called distributed parameters. Then you have the frequency dependent line, uh, the acronym is FD. Um, this model is used for uh, overhead line only. It also reproduces, of course, traveling waves, but in a larger frequency band, uh, basically valid from uh, the, the fundamental frequency up to the um, lightning or lightning region. Um, it's, so it's, it's valid for balanced overhead lines, not for cable. Um, it doesn't behave so well when you simulate largely unbalanced phenomena. So it isn't, it isn't recommended to use it for this, but for the rest, it's working fine. Then you have here the wideband model. Uh, so the wideband, it's actually the latest uh, addition to, uh, to EMTP. And this is the most accurate model. So that's the one we recommend you to use the whole time. Uh, obviously, when the time step constraint is, uh, is possible. Um, the, the main difference mathematically with the uh, FD model is that both use the transformation matrix to go from the ABC domain to a special uh, eigenvalue model. And the transformation matrix used for the wideband is also frequency dependent, whereas for 
the frequency dependent model, uh, this, uh, this transformation matrix is not frequency dependent, only the eigenvalues are. Um, this model is also a must use for cables, uh, underground cables. So what type of parameter do you use to, uh, to use the, the you, do you need to use the parameter calculator? Uh, when, you're talk, when we're talking about an overhead line, uh, you will need here the tower geometry. So the position of each conductors, of each conductor on the tower, the horizontal distance, the vertical distance, for the horizontal distance, obviously, it's what we are interested in is the distance between each conductor. So the way it works, users may decide where the zero is. So typically, you will put the zero at the in the middle, and then the for example here the conductor four will be at plus 0 0.22, and the three will be at minus 0 0.2286. You will also need, of course, the line length the DC resistance, the conductor DC resistances, um, and also the, the sag, the, the overhead line sag between two towers. Uh, this information may be, may be more difficult to get. And so in this case, we will show you after you can uh, use an option so it is estimated and so you don't have to put it. Another parameter which may be tough to get is the, the uh, ground resistivity, which is used to calculate the zero sequence. Uh, here you, you may use typical values of like 300 ohms, for example. So when you enter all this data, you then have the option to simply use those data to calculate the sequence parameters, positive and uh, zero sequence, if you don't already have them. Uh, but most of the time, those are used to calculate the frequency dependent model so it will create a model that you can use. For underground cables, um, you have two types. The first one shown here is the cable type. So you will need, this, this, in a similar manner, the position of the cable underground and the, between each, o of, uh, each other, but also the information and all the insulation and uh, conductor layers inside. Uh, we'll, uh, I will show you after when, when we are going to build one, but you will need several uh, parameters like uh, the resistivity um, the, and some uh, insulation characteristic. For pipe type, very similar, except that here all cables are gathered inside a pipe. So the, in, in addition to the position of the cables, you will need to provide the position of the pipe. All right, so to uh, sum up the how, what model to use for which study, like we said, for low frequency, fin, uh, low frequency studies, like load flow, uh, transients, and so on, you may use a pi model. You may also use a CP, a frequency dependent, or a wide band. For harmonic analysis, uh, the pi model isn't good anymore, as we've seen that this the pi model is the parameters are for 60 hertz, and there is only one, um, one uh, natural frequency which may not be at a realistic place. There is a specific pi model, which is called the exact pi, which is only a phasor domain model, so you cannot use it in time domain. But it will basically calculate pi parameters for each frequency. Uh, so in this case, you, you can use this one. We won't show here how to build it because uh, we just simply recommend to use FD or wideband instead of exact pi. Uh, you need the same amount of information to use the exact pi model. Uh, the CP model isn't really valid for harmonic analysis. If the line is fairly short, uh, it's, uh, it may be okay, but else, basically, if the first pole of the line uh, gets inside the harmonic uh, region you study, then this, the CP will not be valid anymore. This conclusion is the same for the pi, basically. Um, the FD and Y bands are good for harmonic analysis. For switching, uh, same thing. The only the, the FD and the Y band will be valid, obviously. For fur resonance, it's the same thing. Uh, fur resonance, you may have a high frequency content, uh, so that's why we recommend to use wideband and uh, and frequency dependent. 
for Lightning against Samsung. One uh, one specification for like one uh, one thing special for Lightning. Sometimes it's uh, because in Lightning you have to model very short conductor sections. Sometimes only few meters. It can be very tough to come out for for the calculator to come with parameters frequency dependent parameters for a very short line. And if the the calculator does not succeed to provide such parameters, then what you can do is simply uh, create a CP line at a high frequency, uh, similar to the lightning frequency, and then use this model instead. All right, so let's see all that in an example. Here I go to the MTP. We have uh, an overhead line, which is model, uh, with, which is basically model using the different models available. So here we have the same line, uh, but with the different models I talked about. So we have here the white band model, uh, the frequency dependent model, the constant parameter model, the pi model. And here what we did is we used the same line, but we cut it in 10, in 10 section and reproduce it with uh, each sections are modeled with a pi. So basically we have 10 pies in series here. Uh, why do we do that? It's Remember I said that the CP was an infinity of pi. So by doing that, we expect to get a model in between, uh, which has a behavior in between the pi and the CP. Uh, those were also experiments done in labs, where basically to, to get the, to, to be able to simulate traveling waves or to reproduce traveling wave, um, th those, this technique was used to put 10 RLC circuits in series and to basically get a better behavior for a line. So here we are going to play a little game uh, so you guys can uh, can do it as well. Uh, what we're going to do is do some simulations here, and I will only show the uh, I will only show the results. And your goal will be to guess which uh, simulation results is correspond to what model. So the first thing we are going to do is simply a scan, a frequency scan. So I go here to simulation options, frequency scan. I will scan up to 20 kilohertz. All right, so then I'm going to open scope view. Um, so I'm going to load the, um, the curves on my other monitor here, so you cannot see the answer before. OK, so here we are basically uh, scanning the impedance of the lines. So we, uh, what I'm going to display is the, the impedance of each line versus the frequency seen basically from this point. OK, so I let you a little bit of time to uh, guess which line is which. So I put numbers here. So which which parameter which uh, model gives this impedance, and which one gives this, and so on. If you want more time to, to think about it, you may pause the video. Uh, but basically here, if we look at number four, we see that there is only one uh, pole here. So the, in the y-axis is the impedance in ohm. And the x-axis is the frequency, so there is only one pole, so we can guess this is the, the number four is the pi. Then if we look at this one, if we count the poles, uh, we can see that there is 10 of them. So we can also here guess that this is the 10 pi. 10 pi put in series. Now it's getting a bit more difficult um, for the three others. Um, if you remember, we said that a CP line is an infinity of pi. So we saw for 10 pi, there is 10 natural frequencies. So what we see is that now, if you put an infinity of pi, you will have basically an infinity of natural frequencies. And that's what is seen here. Uh, why? How, how do we know this one is a CP? It's because we see that the pattern here is repeated um, and, and uh, forever, basically, whatever the frequency is. 
which is not the case for the, the two others. The two others, by the way, are very identical uh, because the line here is uh, balanced. So this is the white band and the frequency dependent. They provide the, the same results. So the line we are seeing here is around uh, 200 kilometers. And now let's superimpose all the um, results to see, to, to see the range of validity for each model for, for a 200 kilometers line. Uh, obviously, the conclusion we are going to, to get here are depend on the line lengths, but also the line parameters. So if we zoom a little bit at the beginning, below 1000 Hertz, we see that uh, right at the start, all models are the same, which means that the impedance below 350 Hertz is the same whatever model you are using. So as long as you're, you're, you're simulating an event with a lower frequency than that, whatever model you're using is fine. Here you have the first pole of the Pi, which you see is off. Uh, so uh, that's why you cannot use the pi um, if uh, you cannot use the pi for transients, except if the line or the cable is very uh, is very short. Then this first this first uh, pole here will be much further in the frequency axis and around the ki the, the kilohertz or the megahertz region. And so that's why the model is then valid for 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 high frequency if the line and or the cable is very short. Then we see that all models are kind of aligned for the first natural frequency. What changes is the, the magnitude. Um, so typically the natural frequency depends on inductance and capacitance. So what we can guess from there is that the inductance and capacitance are the same for all models, but only the resistance change, change, uh, changes at, the, at this point. And this is due to uh, the skin effect. Now, if we go further in the frequency axis, we see that slowly the, uh, the poles are drifting apart, which indicate that um, either or both of the inductance and capacitance are not, values are not changing. Uh, and obviously, the, the magnitude is changing as well. We see the, the red part, which is the 10 pi, was following the CP very well at the beginning, but now slowly it's drifting away as well. And we can guess that if instead of using 10 pi, we were using 100 pi, then we will follow the, the CP for a longer period of time. It's kind of like a Fourier decomposition uh, where you trunk the number of terms. And as we go further then, uh, we'll we can see the drift between CP and white band or frequency dependent. Okay, so here we are in the frequency domain. Uh, the, X, the X axis is the frequency. We are going to do the same game for time domain. So what I'm going to do is exclude those uh, uh, input impedance devices and I'm going to include a, an ideal voltage source. At the right, at the beginning of the, the simulation, we're going to turn on those uh, voltage sources. And so it's the same as energizing the line. Then I'm going to show you the, the waveform seen at the end of the line. And you, you are going to have to guess. All right, so let me arrange again the graphs in the similar manner that I have done before. And give some names. All right, it's coming here. Okay, so what do we see when we energize the line? Obviously, we have some transients at the beginning, and then eventually, all lines goes to a, the same sinusoidal behavior, which is probably identical. We are going to see that. Now let's zoom a little bit at the beginning so we can try to see what, uh, what's happening and what model is giving what. So if you want to play the game and guess um, which model produces which waveform, you may pause the video now and uh, think by yourself. 
Um, so over here, uh, if you remember for the pi, we had one natural frequency. In time domain, what does it mean a natural frequency? It means a sinusoidal, a perfect sinusoidal. So here we have a perfect sinusoidal on top of the fundamental frequency, which is in this case 60 Hertz. And so this will be graph number three. We see here the perfect sinusoidal and the fundamental frequency. So the pi will be this one. Now it's a bit more difficult to see that, but we can guess that number one is the 10 pi, and basically we have 10 uh, sinusoidals on top of each other. Uh, it's hard to distinguish, uh, but yeah, that's what happened here. And like before, what is tough is now to differentiate the, um, the CP and the FD. What we can see here, sorry about that. What you can see here is that in this one, we have a step. Uh, if we zoom a little bit more, here we have a step. A step in time domain correspond to an infinity of natural frequencies in, in, the, um, in the frequency domain. So that's how we can guess that here, this would be the CP line because we have a perfect square due to the infinity of natural frequencies, whereas for FD and the wide band um, for high frequencies because of the resistance, the uh, natural frequencies magnitude were getting to zero and that's why it's not as square as it is. Now let's do the same exercise as before and superimpose all of them. Okay, so the same conclusions as before, we see that the if I zoom slightly, if I unzoom a little bit, okay, we see that the sinusoidal produced by the pi is not in phase with the other, uh, or is simply not the same frequency, in fact. Um, then we see that all the others are actually in phase, uh, are actually uh, having the same first natural frequency. The 10 pi, which is in red, is trying to follow the CP. Let me close uh, that. It's trying to follow the CP uh, as much as it can. And uh, then if we zoom a little bit more, uh, we see here the step of the CP uh, uh, compared to the frequency dependent. Why this, is, this may be important, um, sometimes it's only the magnitude of the over voltage which is important, but sometimes it's also the variation of the voltage. Uh, for example, when you do a transient recovery voltage, you have a breaker which disconnects. Uh, then what is important is uh, how fast the, val the voltage rises on each side of the breaker. And here, if you use obviously a CP, you may get um, much more um, uh, dramatic results compared to a, fr a frequency dependent. And you will tell me, yeah, okay, but it, it's more conservative, so it's fine. And I would agree with that. Uh, however, the goal is to get result as um, precise as we can, and then apply a safety, co uh, safety coefficient on top of it. Okay, so let's now see how we build those lines and how we use the line data uh, calculator. So basically here in the lines library, you have a device which is called line data. Um, of course, when you open it by default, it's uh, completely empty. But for the sake of the demonstration, I will use the one which is already pre-filled. In, in, in this version of the MTP, uh, the way it works, we use this uh, line data to calculate parameters for overhead line for cables, we're going to use cable data. And those will generate files, what we call model files. For example, here you see for the frequency dependent, the file is a .pun. For a CP, the, the file is .csv. Okay, and for wideband, I will explain a little bit after, but it's a bit more difficult. Um, actually, .pum was the format used in the previous version, but in, the, in this version here, it's .mod uh, for the frequency dependent model. Well, so let me show you how it works on FD first. 
So you open this um, line uh, data uh, uh, mask. Um, first here you have the module, so you have basically two options with this tool. It's either to create a line parameter, a line model, which is what we do most of the time. Uh, but you can also use this tool only to calculate parameters. In this case, you will use, use this option. Then you decide the metric, uh, the units. So metric will be in meter and kilometers, centimeters and so on, and English will be in feet and miles. Then the input options. Uh, most of the time, the input you are going to use is the standard conductor data, where you put the tower geometry. And however, it exists an option uh, to use sequence data in order to create a frequency dependent model. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend to use this option because we are using some uh, uh, simplification and uh, hypothesis here which may not be true. Um, however, this, uh, this uh, um, option exists. Um, if you need to use a tower from the database, you can access it from here. And so basically, you when you click on this link, you have uh, the database opening here, I may zoom, and you can select the type of line and click on OK, and it will automatically populate uh, this table. So what is it, this table? It's uh, what I was showing on the slide. Let me quickly go back here. So it's basically all this information. In this particular case, we have here eight conductors, two ground and two per phase. So that's what you will write. Here, in this case, we have two ground conductor with the phase number is zero because they are neutral. And then one, two, three correspond to ABC. Um, you may select several conductors per phase. In this case, you will have two line with one, uh, two line with two, and two line with three. Um, the reason we put same phase number, it means that at the end, here we can keep, we have a three phase device instead of having a six phase device. Okay, we enter the DC resistance here. Uh, for here it's for the ground conductors, here for the phase conductors, the di outside diameters, the horizontal distances, the vertical height, uh, the vertical height at the tower, and here to model the sag of the of the conductors, you have the vertical height at mid span. Um, may you don't have, you don't have this uh, data. What you can do is just put the same value here, and in this case, the routine will estimate this value. So that's what is done very often. All right, then you may uh, change also the way we are going to take into account the skin effect. Typically, for neutral conductors, so for the chill, chilling wires, uh, we will model them as a solid conductor. And then if you go to the other conductors, um, you, you have uh, more options. For example, uh, often you will consider the, the thickness of the aluminium layer of the, uh, uh, of the conductor versus the overall diameter. Uh, so then you can select that here, thickness versus diameter, and put this value here. Um, also, you have the options to consider pendle conductors. So that's when you have, instead of having one conductor, you have three of them, and they are attached together. So you have the option here. Okay, if you, have, if you are, are in a high altitude, uh, you can uh, specify here the relative permeability. So these input data are the same whatever model you use, uh, CP, wideband, and etc. Uh, again, the, you are using this routine to calculate parameters. If you already have uh, sequence data, you can enter them directly here in the CP model. Oh, sorry, you, you, you enter them here, you select the CP model and you select RLC, and then you have here the sequence data RLC to enter. One will be the zero sequence, two will be the positive sequence. Um, obviously, in the line theory, this is assumed the line is continuously transposed. Um, if the line isn't continuously transposed, then you cannot, uh, uh, cannot use sequence data as propagation mode. You have to use the line data calculate impedances. Okay, going back where I was, so that's it for the first tab. Then in the second tab, you select the model. Um, so FD, CP, exact pi, wideband, 
Um, you, you can also take the simplification that, that, that the line is balanced or simply use real TI if you want uh, to, have to be as precise as possible. Um, here I recommend you to check uh, fine model frequency automatically. This is the frequency for the, um, the, the transformation matrix. Uh, however, you can specify it if you want. Then you go to the line lengths, you can enter here the line length, so 193.1 kilometers, also the ground resistivity in ohm meters. And that's pretty much it for data. Okay, you have here some more tabs. Uh, this one is an output option, so when you are going to launch this calculator, uh, you may ask to, for the, the calculator to print some options. So you can uh, check them out here. Um, you also have the options to do some transposition. Um, so in this, you, you, can, you have the option here. However, what I would recommend, which is visually I find better, is if you want to do a transposition between two sections of line, simply create the two lines and then use the bus to ABC device here to do the transposition. So the bus to ABC will go from three phase to one phase and then you can route uh, each phase between A to B, B to C, and etc. to create the transposition in the GUI. The fitting, uh, typically you don't have to touch here. Uh, maybe if, you are, if, you have, if the routine has trouble to create the model, you may increase the number of pole uh, if the line is short, for example. All right, so now you're finished. You just have to give a name to your, uh, to your line model, so just so you can recognize it and check run and click on OK. All right, so here you see in the console that the line has been created successfully. And like I explained before in, in this uh, version 4.1, the file name is .mod, it's not .pun anymore. So the file is there, it has been created in the same location as the design. So the final step is to grab a, a frequency dependent line and select this file here. Okay, so you see that automatically it creates a three-phase line. We don't see the ground conductors because those were assigned to the number zero. If we had several conductors, I'm not talking about bundle, but several conductors on the same phase, we will still have only one pin as long as they have the same number here. Now, if you want to use a bundled representation of the three-phase, uh, go in the mask in the drawing section and check here, use three-phase line type and apply the changes. You may also change the length of this line. Okay, so that's how you create your frequency dependent model of line. Quickly now to finish uh, for white band, it's almost exactly the same except that uh, here you select obviously white band model. You may here change the parameters for the frequency band, but I wouldn't recommend that. And also you can, for example, select here unbalanced line. So you, you model line more precisely if, for example, you don't consider the transposition. Similarly, you will uh, create this file, uh, wideband 193. The, the little difference here is that this file isn't the one that we are going to use for this model. Uh, in this version, we have to use an extra fitter that will basically fit the transformation matrix. Uh, so the way it works, you select here the file that you just created, WB193. Um, it's a fitting process, so you may enter a tolerance. For short conductors, I recommend a very small tolerance, uh, you, 0.1. For long lines like that, 1% is fine. When you do the fitting, um, uh, we are using pole fitting, so it's possible we create a model which is not passive anymore. Then I would recommend you to use the, the to, to perform the passivity test, and you will receive a message if you have any problem. If it's the case, if you do have a problem, then you, you may use the cable model correction options, which will uh, make sure the uh, enforce the passivity. Um, and finally, if you're if you modeling cables or lines for DC uh, system, like HVDCs, uh, you may check DC correction. You're gonna okay, now the, uh, the, the routine is starting and uh, 
is calculating the model. This may take few seconds or minutes. If it's the first time since you started the computer that you start the routine, it's possible MATLAB takes a little bit of time to start. So be just uh, please be patient. And uh, now it's finished. So similarly to before, uh, as before, you now drag and drop the white band line cable and uh, select this newly created WB190.MOD. And that's it. Your white band model is created. All right. Thanks uh, again for watching this um, this uh, train this uh, short training. Okay, I put here again the summary in case if you want to take a look at it. Um, I hope you enjoy. Uh, bye. Have a good day.